Every state has an involuntary commitment law. Uh, the Baker Act rules are basically this. If a person has a mental illness, and as a result of that mental illness, they become a danger to themselves or others, then you can engage in what's called the Baker Act. The problem is, is that sometimes people jump to a Baker Act at the far end as opposed to trying everything else first. The Baker Act really is, is a last step resort. It's that time when a person just is not able to manage and you have to engage them and your goal is really keep them safe. It doesn't engage the person necessarily in treatment right away. That happens as a course of the Baker Act, but the Baker Act itself is intended to maintain safety. And so as a service system, we jump people to that, I think sometimes prematurely. In kids, we do that way too early sometimes. I think, you know, if you look at the statistics last year, there were 36,000 children uh, Baker Acted. The biggest portion of those were done by police. And I think that's a result of families not knowing and not having those lower level services to help figure out what to do with those children and calling the police and the police not knowing what to do, so they just Baker Act. And so our job sometimes at our system, and especially at, at our child program, is to look at those kids, figure out do they really need to be in a hospital? Because you don't want to put anybody in a hospital that doesn't need to be there. What you really want to do is get them to the right level of care. And so a large portion of both our child and adult Baker X are not admitted, but sent out to a lower level system. There were 36,000 Baker X in the state of Florida for children. Um, that, that came out of an article that was, uh, I think, published in the Orlando Sentinel. Um, and I think on top of that, you add to that the number of adult Baker Acts. We're, we're seeing a large portion of these folks dropped into the highest level of service system when they really don't need to be there. But one of the things that's the, the biggest risk to that, and I, I want to kind of point this out, is when you Baker Act a person prematurely and they don't need to be in the hospital, you've now given them the impression that they're not safe to go into another level of care. And so a lot of times those people don't engage in lower services simply because they're afraid of what's gonna to happen to them. And they don't wanna lose their rights of, of things. So when you go to a Baker Act, you're really taking a person's civil rights, both a child and an adult. And to some extent, the family, because once the child is Baker Acted, the family really has no say in what happens. And so I think we, we ought to approach that knowing that it's necessary, but at the same time realizing uh, that it's not always the first step to go at. Baker Acts, um, because of the nature of, the, of what they intend, which is safety, the person that shows up 90% of the time is law enforcement. They will come and they will take control and custody of the individual, whether it be a child or adult. When they do that, they handcuff them. And we've had kids as low as three and four years old brought in in handcuffs, as well as 80-year-old people brought in in handcuffs. The trauma that's associated with that is, is pretty profound because it, it causes people to become very, very afraid. They're put in, uh, they're put in handcuffs, they're locked in the back seat of a car, uh, they're taken to a hospital. They never get the opportunity to say, no, I'm not going to go, or no, I don't want to go, or no, I'll do something else. So when they get to the hospital, they then go into a locked area where you then uh, again engage and do an evaluation. Families and caregivers are an essential piece to that. What happens is, is that when the person shows up, a lot of times they're a lot calmer, they're a lot different than what they describe. And so if we can get families to be engaged, if they do do a Baker Act, to come to the hospital or to call and say, this is what's going on, that becomes tremendously helpful to us to figure out really what that person's level of care is. The sad part in our system right now is, is that we have a really weak system for folks that don't meet the criteria but do need something else. So for example, uh, we sometimes get folks in that have dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, and the law says we can't Baker Act them. We can't put them in a psychiatric facility. Um, they, in fact, they, if we go to the judge, the judge will say discharge them immediately. And so those people really do need to have some kind of safety mechanism, but unfortunately this system isn't the best way. Um, and, and so it becomes somewhat scary for families because they, they call the police, they send a person off, they, they are told sometimes, well, you'll get them back in 72 hours. 
but that's not the case. They can be back within a very brief period of time based on what the evaluation shows. And so we try really hard to do what makes sense for the patient and do what's right, but at the same time, we can't violate their, their civil rights uh, as an individual. In a lot of um, service systems, and this service system doesn't really have it, they have what's called respite. And, and, and it's usually a paid for service by the mental health system that allows for families and caregivers to get a break. What happens in this system is that there's really no respite services. There's no ability to call someone and say, can you do such and such with my person or with my, my mother, my father, my child for the next six hours. One of the scariest things for families is that period of time where they can't get any breaks. And, and so we see family systems begin to really kind of deteriorate when the conflict is so often and so intense that there's no way to separate it. Sometimes um, I tell families, if you could just get two hours to go to the grocery store without your child who's acting out all over the place, that would give you some sense of relief. But the problem is the system doesn't support that and doesn't help that. So we really have to rely on what's called the, 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 the non-professional system, which is using faith groups and churches and uh, people that we're attached to and family members to come in and give those folks, those caregivers, uh, some, some time away. Respite becomes not just a, a formal thing, but an informal thing just in giving those breaks.